Sing for Hope mobilizes world-class artists who donate time and talent. Volunteer services that benefit schools, hospitals, and communities. As head of the New York City Housing Authority Youth Chorus, I've seen the difference that this organization makes in the life of young people. Sing for Hope brings a wealth of knowledge, talent, and education to young people. And the teaching artists that come from Sing for Hope really act as excellent role models. And it really makes a world of difference. I'm a praying man and I pray every day for the right help. And Sing for Hope is the right help. Where Sing for Hope fits in at Mount Sinai um, is that they bring what I can only describe as enlightened beauty to the lives of patients who are, for the most part, trapped in the hospital. It's more than just the art, um, the music, the dance, and the singing. They bring the compassion and the humanity because what they bring is people who perform. Not a television set that plays music, not an iPod or a radio, but an actual human being whose mere presence um, proves to our patients that they still matter, despite how dysfunctional healthcare is. Um, it proves to our doctors that the patients are human beings surrounded by a world of culture and art and beauty. There are a lot of walls up between people and the consumption of art. So we're bringing the art to them. We're making art radically accessible to all. We break down that barrier and they can touch it and they can hear it and they can experience it in a completely new way. It's about the creative spark that lives in every person. The theme of Sing for Hope is art for all. It's about connecting people with the creative spirit that's inside all of us. Hello everybody, we're so thrilled to have you joining us today on this extraordinary webinar and what a beautiful way to start. Um, I think today in these surroundings and situations, the message that Sing for Hope pass on, uh, Arts for All, is a really important one and I know that our students all around the world and teachers are going to learn an awful lot from this wonderful webinar. Um, before we start, I just wanted to share a little bit about Monica and Camille. Monica is the co-founder and co-executive director of Sing for Hope. She has performed with the world's leading opera companies, including the Metropolitan Opera, Washington National Opera, the Zouk Festival, and in recitals in Spain, Guatemala, and her native Bangladesh. She has been named the 2016 Young Global Leader of the World Economic Forum, honored with the 21st Century Leaders Award, as New Yorker of the Week by NY1 and named one of the top 50 Americans in philanthropy by town and country. A leading voice in the artist of citizen discussion, she has performed and spoken at the Fortune's Most Powerful Women's Summit, Skull World Forum, Aspen Ideas Festival and the United Nations. She's also a graduate of the Juilliard School. Welcome Monica, we're so lucky to have you here today. 
Camille is the co-founder and co-executive director of Sing for Hope. An internationally acclaimed soprano, she has appeared with collaborators ranging from Placido Domingo to Sting, with ensembles including London Symphony and Glimmerglass, Glimmerglass Opera, and in live broadcast on NPR, BBC Radio and Deutsch Radio and Sirius. A graduate of the Juilliard School, she has been recognized by the Congressional Hispanic Caucus and named one of CNN's most intriguing people. NY1's New Yorker of the Week and one of the top 50 Americans in philanthropy by town and country. A regular contributor to the Huffington Post and a leading voice in the artist of citizen discussion, Camille has performed and spoken at Fortune's most powerful women's summit, Skoll World Forum, Aspen Ideas Festival, and the United Nations. Welcome, Camille. Thank you. Okay, um, and I'd like to give you a little bit of background about Sing for Hope and Nord Anglo's collaboration too. Um, so as some of you might know, UNICEF and Sing for Hope partnered on the provision of a piano at UNICEF's side event at the High Level Political Forum last summer. And during that event, Sing for Hope, Juilliard, um, and UNICEF and Nord Anglia all collaborated on an incredible musical piece called Dream Big, Speak Loud, where Nord Anglia students acted as the chorus for a young Broadway singer accompanied by the gift of piano. We're really excited to have Sing for Hope to talk to Nord Anglia students about their outreach programme, Sing for Hope Grams, which will later act as an inspiration for the Global Campus Summer Community Outreach Challenge. So Monica and Camille, it's over to you. Thank you. It's such a joy to be here with you all. And, you know, I have to say, we, I'm always struck whenever I start these, these video moments, how much I, I am thankful for this te technology, even as admittedly, I wish that we were together in person. So we had the great joy of being with you all together um, in person last summer at the UN. And yeah, it's just terrific to, to continue the conversation a bit this morning. Hi everyone, I'm so delighted for this collaboration. We're grateful to everyone at Nord Anglia and to UNICEF for bringing us all together. And we just like to take this time to tell you a little bit more about Sing for Hope, what we're doing um, in our new COVID reality of, of being socially distanced and still bringing the arts to communities in need, which really means all of us because the arts are a way for all of us to feel uplifted and to, sh to seek out our shared humanity. And I think it's a wonderful way of connection. And regardless of whether or not you're on an enormous stage, there's still an opportunity to use the arts to better our world. So I'm gonna turn it to Camille to give you a sort of a little bit of a background of where Sync for Hope started, who we are, and um, we'll take it from there. Absolutely. Thank you, Monica. So, you know, I, I was thinking this morning as I was getting excited for this conversation about how, you know, really how special it is to be speaking with you all this morning, because I imagine through the beautiful moments that you've had together as students and as, as faculty and as collaborators in this educational environment, um, the beautiful moments and the incredible challenges that you have been through, all of you know, through all of your years in schooling, but in particular in the last uh, semester, I, I do know that there is an incredible bond that you all are forging. And one of my dearest truths about Sing for Hope is that it is the product of a profound bond in my life. Uh, Monica Yunus and I met and just for the second we sort of started chatting back in 1999, right before I started my first year at Juilliard as grad student, we just got along like a house on fire. We just couldn't stop chatting and it's because I think we aligned on so many different things. We aligned in our incredible passion for this wonderful and strange art form called opera and I think we both also really aligned on the fact that we had questions about the delivery systems for the arts as much as we loved you know a good Mozart opera and a beautiful theater there were also questions about the social justice realities of classical music in our society and you know who is invited in and does everyone have access to music education and I think this is something that kind of informed us in my case my family had been in the Peace Corps my parents had been in the Peace Corps I sort of grew up with that in the back of my head Monica's family has an amazing legacy of social justice work her mother had been an incredible social worker 
Her father is Nobel Peace Laureate Mohammed Yunus, who um, is the father of microfinance. So she grew up definitely with this sort of questions about social justice and, and looking at our societal systems and asking ourselves how we can be better. So all of that was kind of the background for our friendship. And we were there at Juilliard, you know, forming our voices, learning how to be on stage, studying with a wonderful voice teacher, Beverly Johnson. And we were just kind of going through our educational lives when an immense crisis hit, not unlike what you all are dealing with right now. Um, we were there on 9-11. In New York City, that was a moment that stopped all of our lives in their tracks. Um, and you know, as, as music students that day, um, it was a beautiful bright Tuesday. We had literally started our classes that morning um, and we found out that the Twin Towers had been hit in New York City and we were left with, the, you know, this sense of paralysis initially. Um, one of the things that's interesting about Juilliard is at Lincoln Center, it shares its city block with a firehouse that was among the first responders that day. And this firehouse, our, our literal neighbors on our city block, um, they lost 13 of their guys. And, you know, we were, they are asking ourselves questions about what on earth can we as musicians do in this time of crisis? What can we possibly contribute when we're just sort of singing scales? And we thought, you know, at the very least, let's just go to the firehouse there on the pavement outside while people are waiting for these fire guys to come back and let's just offer some songs. And so we did, there was a group of about six or seven of us and we went and just started singing and the guys cried we cried, the families cried, and we realized that we had something as artists to contribute in that moment. So in the months that followed, we began singing at other firehouses around New York City that extended to singing in schools and hospitals and other places that can sort of benefit from that shot of, of hope that the arts can bring. And um, it sort of began a conversation. So. Monica, I'll hand it to you now to tell a little bit about how Hurricane Katrina further um, it forwarded this conversation. So again, we're students just like you all are and not knowing much about what it was that we were doing in terms of a larger organizational framework. But we knew that we wanted to give something back and we knew that artists had this very unique way of almost, you know, opening a heart um, and healing a part of, of the pain that that, that that particular moment caused. So we went on our way with um, starting the organization, again, not really knowing what we were doing, and we called on artists of all kinds, uh, instrumentalists, dancers, singers. We named it Sing for Hope because we're singers, but that does not reflect the thousands of artists that participate in our ongoing programs. So maybe telling you a little bit about where we are today is a good, uh, is a good segue. Today, we're, the organization is 15 years old. We have over 5,000 artists who volunteer their time in schools, hospitals, and elder care facilities in programs, not only in New York City, but in places like Greece, where we have Sing for Hope pianos. Sing for Hope is probably best known for the Sing for Hope pianos. We place beautifully artist created pianos in the parks and public spaces of New York's five boroughs for anyone and everyone to play. Um, those pianos, those Sing for Hope pianos are out in the parks and public spaces for three weeks and they are an invitation. They really are sort of a stake in the ground for who we are as an organization. This art, this opportunity to create is for you. And that's the invitation of the Sing for Hope pianos. After their time on, in the parks and public spaces, we place them in schools. Many schools in the United States do not have working um, tuned pianos. So we saw this as an opportunity to take these incredible sort of invitations to create, these markers of um, th these, uh, you know, very large invitations to create and place them in public schools. So we send our artists to those schools. We have programming in the school systems. We have many, many other organizations that use those Sing for Hope pianos in their programming when they come to the schools. So it's a wonderful way to um, create music in the schools year round. Um, 
And that's a part of something that I think Camille was alluding to before. At Sing for Hope, we believe in something that we call citizen artistry. So I'm sure many of you have heard and well know the sustainable development goals. And I think for us as an organization, we like to think about what we're doing to further those SDGs. And for us, we lean into three of the SDGs, sustainable cities and communities, quality education, and, and I am totally spacing on the third one. Camille, help Health, me out. Healthcare and well-being. Healthcare <laughs> and well-being. And those three SDGs are primary in the, the goals of the organization and the kinds of programming that we develop. And it also points to something that we lean into a lot, which is citizen artistry. And that's simply that artists have an opportunity to play their role in society. And so as, as Camille said before, I think going into Juilliard, Camille and I were very excited to pursue our dream of singing on you know, some of the greatest stages across the world. And we've been very fortunate to do that. And in parallel, we've also developed what I like to call this, this sort of opportunity for all artists to engage with their citizenship in an artistic and creative way. And really that's all, when we say citizen artistry, that's all that we're saying, is that artists have this opportunity to be invited into the societal conversation that's going on when we speak about SDGs, when we speak about creativity and how that drives innovation in so many different ways in so many different sectors. And I think that's a really key component to, um, to our organization and the way we think about our programs is that we have this opportunity to give back, not only through the incredible artistry on stages, but also as, as, as um, an important voice in our societal engagement. I love how you said that, Monica, because you know, Let's face it, I, I, I imagine there are a fair, fair number of artists and creatives at participating in this webinar right now. Um, we as artists are sort of used to being often relegated to the side, frankly, and, and to be thought of as, you know, the arts. It's a nice to have, it's not a need to have. And what we always say at St. for Hope is that the truth is, it's very hard to address fundamental issues of social justice, of well-being, of positive change without addressing spirit without addressing morale, emotion, whatever word you want to use. But that fundamental human essence is directly addressed through the arts. And when you when you do that, when you when you bring people hope and 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 you know activate that hope in ourselves, it becomes much easier to do the work of the day. And if the work of the day, as it is right now, is fundamental and profound and deals with sort of the building blocks of society, then you do very well to kind of optimize your chances for success by using those artistic tools. Listen, it's, it's nothing new under the sun. It's, it can be as simple as listening to a song that puts you in a better mood. It can be as simple as, as having a day in which you're feeling really blocked and just allowing yourself to doodle and finding that, ah, oh, my creative juices are starting to flow. Aside from those individual activations, we also believe that the creating of sort of social shared communal creative experiences is something that really drives social goals. And so Monica did mention the Sing for Hope pianos. They are the country's largest public art project in terms of media impressions, which means that they've received more attention than any other sort of creative project in the United States in the last decade. And what that means is that people just really come to think of them as a sign of summer in New York City and a way that, you know, these, something as simple as kind of this instrument causes people to stop and engage in a way that they wouldn't normally do necessarily. You might not necessarily get the pizza delivery guy and the nanny and the stockbroker all together sharing a human bond around a song on a piano. And our feeling is that when you kind of address those, those basic sort of social building blocks, it optimizes you for success in many, many other realms. Success in educational systems, success in healing, and success in building a more just society. And this is really, this is really sort of uh, what we're looking at on a daily basis right now. Um, certainly, you know, I'm here in New York City, we are dealing with incredible challenges. Um, 
you know, the that, that brings up a great, a great point. So I think, you know, we were sort of telling you about Sing for Hope pre-COVID. The reality of it is that here we are, I would much rather be doing this discussion in person, but in our COVID-19 world, that's not a possibility. And therefore, the Sing for Hope pianos as well this summer were not a possibility. So at, even as we were gearing up to do our 10th year of bringing Sing for Hope pianos to New York City, all of that came to a halting stop. In addition to that, the hospitals that we served also said we cannot allow any volunteers, any of the programming that, that you do live has to be stopped. So I wanna sort of take you through a day in the life of Sing for Hope before <laughs> and a day in the life of Sing for Hope today. Before, we would have artist partners coming into our office for orientation saying, hey, I wanna be a Sing for Hope artist. I wanna volunteer, how do I do it? So they go to our website, singforhope.org, they sign up locally in New York City, they come through our doors in the office and have a wonderful orientation where we sort of take them through the options, the menu of options in which they can participate, which includes our healing arts program. And that is where they, they go through this orientation, which sort of gives them the overview of our, the facilities that we work with, the sort of rules of engagement from the hospital side, and the rules of engagement from the Sing for Hope side. And they bring their artistry. And um, on any regular week, we would have artists going into various uh, nursing facilities, elder care facilities, everywhere from you know Brooklyn to the Bronx to Manhattan to Staten Island. And these artists would, would tote along their instruments, their voices, their paintbrushes, and they would do things like responsive painting while a pianist was playing, you know, incredible music, or they would do a movement class for the um, elder care facility. All of that was stopped during this time. So what we as an organization had to do was say, okay, how can we do this in a virtual way? And just like everyone else, we got tech savvy pretty quickly, thanks to things like Zoom and other, other wonderful things that we've, we've all been using. Um, and, you know, it's, it's a way, again, to bring the faces that those communities are used to seeing, their artist friends coming through the doors, um, except now they're coming through their, their computer screens or their tablet screens. Um, it's not been, truth be told, it's not been an easy process because these facilities have been taxed. Um, we go to a lot of facilities where, you know, many patients don't have their own tablet. The hospital system may not have a room where they can socially distance patients while you're on a screen. So it's been a process. And I think, you know, that is something that Sing for Hope has been committed to in terms of having uh, the discussions with, um, with, with the hospital administration so that we could go to those places. Because the fact of the matter is um, one of the largest epidemics in our country is loneliness. And so we're all facing that um, that this time where we can't necessarily be with our loved ones who may be uh, compromised health-wise. So what is it that we can do to bring a smile, to connect, to again, have that shared human experience? And I wanna point something out that's very important. I'm sure there's not a single person on this call who has not enjoyed a wonderful movie or listened to an incredible song that soothes them or watches um, or reads an incredible uh, book that they've been meaning to and this was a great time to do it. Guess what? All of that falls under the banner arts. And so I think that it's really important for all of us to know and feel that during this time, that's what we've all turned to. That is that, that creative outlet, that outlet for, um, again, having that shared human experience, whether it's through someone else's words or through someone else's rendition of a song or, or creating something your, yourselves. And I hope that many of you have been doing that, um, you know, tapping into that create, creativity, as Camille said. So again, I just wanted to give you sort of the scope of what a day in the life of Sing for Hope was before and what it is now. And um, maybe Camille, you can speak to some of the other sort of innovative ways in which we've, we've wanted to engage our incredible artist roster. 
Absolutely. So, you know, I, I, Monica sort of described what we keep referring to. We keep hearing this term pivot, positive pivots. You know, we had to pivot from something that is, listen, essentially a live experience. I mean, so much of what I love about the arts is that live human interaction. We've had to pivot that onto this screen that we are all on. Um, and I think we've also had to look at something, which is that our power source, which is to say artists, um, they have also been dealt a huge blow through this COVID pandemic, which is basically our industry is on hiatus indefinitely. So what that means is that all of the Broadway theaters are closed. The opera theaters of the world are pretty much all closed right now. And so we, that was another pivot that we made quickly from going from leveraging volunteerism of all these wonderful artists who sing on Broadway and in theaters and you know sell their arts and galleries well without that income stream suddenly we wanted to realize that they too we too as artists are a community in need during this time so we have uh, pivoted to not leveraging volunteerism but rather paying through this through this programs program um finding new ways i think to think about how we work with our artists and to see these programs these you know, kind of what fall under the banner of kind of community outreach, to see them as really driving value to the global marketplace and therefore being paid as such. And I think, you know, one of the great, um, you know, I will say positive aspects of these last months has been that we in our, you know, in the arts, and I, I will include all of us on this webinar as that, we are all in the arts, we are all artists, we all have that creative spark. We have a great gift, which is that we, are, we have artistic habits of mind. We are used to thinking about funny solutions and, and beautiful ways of trying an unexpected um, path. And so we have used that as kind of our meta during this time and tried to think really outside the box and what are new ways that we can find income for our entire industry. And I do think, um, you know, distilling the arts down to that fundamental thing Monica mentioned, you know, again, this ongoing against against the backdrop of, of COVID, we have another ongoing global pandemic, which is loneliness. And to be able to address that through the arts. You know, I love, uh, I love to look at the origins of words and the word inspiration and respiration have the same kernel, which is spirit. The Latin spirit means two things. It means both breath and soul. So when I, go through respiration, I breathe, and we've all learned that during this COVID time, with face masks and all, respiration together can be problematic. And we are trying to figure out how to be in a world where we literally can breathe together. Meantime, inspiration, the taking in of spirit and delivering of spirit to another human being through a creative act, that is constant. We can always do that. So I think finding new ways to deliver creativity, you all are capable of this. I'm sure you're doing it on a daily basis. And it can be, again, as simple as a doodle, as simple as a song you're singing to yourself or to a friend. This is a way that we can deliver spirit, soul, and that, that sense of well-being between people, even when we are having to go through the medium of Zoom. You know, we still can feel that fundamental human inspiration and connection. And so to that end, we sought to figure out a way in which we could pay the artists, which was new for, for us as an organization because we, were, we had many, many artist partner volunteers. And yet at this time, as Camille said, um, and this is an interesting st statistic, in the United States, 95% of arts organizations have canceled their seasons. That means until at least through the end of this year, no stages will open. So that means that all the um, artists, the costume designers, the directors, the, um, and the audience certainly will not be together. And that means that those artists will not be paid. So we decided to try to hit lots of things at once. One, people are lonely. Could we deliver something to them? Enter Sing for Hope Grams. We had all these incredible artists who are at home and we have many of them who have signed up through Sing for Hope to deliver what we call Sing for Hope Grams. And Sing for Hope Grams are very simply 
just like little singing telegrams that used to be once upon a time delivered to somebody's doorstep or to somebody's office to brighten up their day. Now you could go onto the Sing for Hope website, order up a Sing for Hope gram, and a Broadway artist or an operatic soprano would call your loved one and sing them a song, an aria, a favorite tune for their birthday, for graduation, for Mother's Day, for Father's Day, for whatever occasion, just to lift their spirits. And in our piloting days, we're still sort of piloting the idea slowly but surely. Camille and I did many of these Sing for Hope grams. And I remember that um, I called uh, a, a, a friend's mother and she was in Texas and she was 95 years old. And she said, well, how, how, how is this happening? I said, well, your friend wanted me to call you and to deliver you a Sing for Hope gram. Do you have a little bit of time? And she said, yes, I do. So I sang her a little song. I think I sang Somewhere Over the Rainbow to her. And she was so delighted. And we had a beautiful chat. And I just asked her how she was doing. How are you? And she said, well, I haven't seen anyone in a lot of, in, in too many weeks. I live by myself, but this has really brightened my day. And I can't even believe that you know where Abilene, Texas is. <laughs> and so she was very excited about that. We had a wonderful chat. And um, she said, you know, I, I was feeling lonely, but this, is, this has uplifted me. So that is one small effort in, again, bringing the, the, the gift of music to someone who needs it. And, um, you know, there's, there's another thing that I'm sure you're also all experiencing, which is this just being on Zoom can be tiring all day. I'm sure you're, you're having all kinds of uh, classwork um, and, the same with, with adults too. They, they've even nicknamed it Zoom fatigue. I'm sure you've heard that. And so we've, we've also brought the Sing for Hope moments to teams where if you have a team of you know, 10, 20, 30 people, and this is a way to bring a little musical jolt to a group of people and uh, allow them that, that musical, uh, musical pause, if you will, in their day. So that is sort of an overview of our Sing for Hope, uh, Sing for Hope Grams program and Sing for Hope Moments program, which I think is something that will continue way beyond COVID. Um, it's again, it's a wonderful way to connect when you can't see the person and can't be be in person with them as we're all going through. And I think it also speaks to um, the innovative nature of artists. You know, this is an opportunity. This is a difficult time. There's no doubt. There is so much turmoil in our world right now. But I like to call myself a, a, a practical optimist. And within that scope, I would say that this is also a great opportunity for us to say, well, you know, I don't like this about what was going on before in our world. So what is it that we can do to transform that, to change that. Because this is a, an enormous once in a lifetime moment to say we're not going back to that pre-COVID world because there were systems in place that didn't work. So what are the creative ways? And I'd love to, I'd love to hear from you, you know, in the chat function, what are the creative ways that you're thinking about? What are the things that you see today that in five years time, in 10 years time, will not be around? What are the things that you would like to see transformed? Because guess what? This is your world. And this is your time to figure out those things. And step by step by step by step, none of this happens overnight. We know that. None of, none of us have a crystal ball to say, what will it look like? But what does the exercise look like that says, I'd like to see that? And what would the steps be to transform that? You know, Camille always brings up this great example, which I, I think is really telling. Um, you know, when, when we were younger and we went on airplanes, people could still smoke. Can you believe it? People would be smoking on the plane. And at some point, somebody decided, that's not, we're not doing that anymore. And they went through the steps and all the channels to say, smoking is no longer allowed on planes. And it's healthier and it's better for all of us. So what are the things like that that you could think of that would be an opportunity for change. There's so many of them. That's such a, a wonderful 
leading question. I love that. You know, it is the classic um, thing that we know in our hearts, and sometimes it's hard, but when we have something difficult, it is a growth opportunity. I would not have wished right now for my you know, my and Monica and all of our friends work with symphonies and orchestras, I would not ever have wished for that to be suspended. But I will tell you that because we have this weird moment where our industry is on pause because the theaters can't be opened, what it's forcing us to do is look at different ways to deliver the arts into society. Monica and I were already doing this on a daily basis through Sing for Hope, but this has given us renewed energy to look at that question. And so one example is as New York City is sl slowly and cautiously starting to reopen, um, one, we've had a couple of very, you know, sort of under the radar little pop-up performances. For example, outdoor performances where, again, we can't bring all of the pianos to all of the parks like we normally do, but we've been able to bring an individual piano here and there. We have a wonderful board member, John Batiste, who's the band leader of The Late Show with Stephen Colbert, and he has done some pop-up concerts um, in front of healthcare facilities. So for the hardworking healthcare workers, before they go in for a 12 hour shift, they listen to some incredible music performed specifically for them with John Batiste. And they go in renewed for their 12 hour shift. So that's a different usage of music. Normally, John would be using his music to perform for you know, millions of people because he'd be showing up at the Ed Sullivan Theater and performing with Steve Colbert. And, you know, that's what he's done for years, and that's normally what would be happening at this time. But because all of the theaters have to be closed right now, he has a moment to deliver his, his value as an artist to society in a different way. And we really do feel, again, Monica's practical optimism. We feel that these great innovations will stick even when our theaters are reopened. We know that there will continue to be more innovative uses of the arts because we've relied on them to drive to drive different deliverables during this COVID time. So that said, I know we've already gotten some wonderful questions from you all and Rachel is with us. Hi guys, we have, um, I love practical optimist. That is going to be my new mantra and I'm going to say it about 50 times a day. It's fabulous. <laughs> and ladies, if anyone can be an embodiment of that, it's you two. Everything you have said is just so inspiring and I think it makes us all uh, feel very proud to be in on this webinar and part of it and then hopefully able to take some of this inspiration into our own versions of what you have created. Um, you're absolutely right. We have some fantastic questions that were posted onto the Global Campus and students listening in your Q&A, um, if you're curious and would like to answer a question, you can also type the question in there and myself and Philippa will do our best to get backwards and forwards with as many questions as we can in the time we have. Um, the first question was on the Global Campus and it's from Darren. He's in the Prague British International School and he asks, what else would you like to achieve through Sing for Hope? I'm so glad, I'm so glad you asked. I want to make sure I wasn't on mute. Um, you know, I, I, I pose the question to all of you, but I definitely have something that, that you know, Camille and I talk about all the time, which is sort of prescription arts. So if you were in a healthcare setting and you could, um, again, with, with what we talked about, loneliness being a huge epidemic, it's, it's, it's driving a lot, of, um, a lot of death, you know, when you think about it, how could, how could that be? But it is the case. There are many, many people today that are lonely. And so how can the arts be a delivery system, a, a prescription for hope? Now, again, I am not, I'm not a scientist, but I am an artist. And I know that there are a lot of scientists out there that are working on these um, analytics as far as how this could work. And there are many hospitals, frankly speaking, that are involving this in, into their um, into their hospital systems. Um, Camille and I are founders of something called the National Organization for Arts and, and Health. Um, and there are many, many different communities that are involving this within their healthcare um, uh, circles. And so I would like to see a day where um, you walk into a doctor's office and you tell him your ailments and they also ask you about not only your exercise regime, but what is your artistic regime? What is the creative habits of mind regime 
that you adhere to. Do you draw every day? Do you listen to music? Do you reflect on it? Um, because that's a key part of our well-being. And I know that um, you know there's there are many people out there who meditate and to and who do those sort of habits of mind. I would like to see that added added and very concentrated effort of including artistic habits of mind uh, into their meditative practice, into their um, workout regime. So I see Sing for Hope as being one of the organizations that tries to drive that forward. So not only, um, again, incorporating artists into conversations like what the SDGs, the, 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 the conversations surrounding the SDGs and our global commitments, um, but also how the arts drives that conversation forward and Sync for Hope specifically using these artistic habits of mind to create a healthier, um, a healthier mindset and a healthier world through the arts. Hey, thank you. I, I love that idea of having a prescription for hope. That's fantastic. So maybe this next question um, links to that. Um, so this is from a teacher, um, David Robinson, from the Nord Anglia International School in Hong Kong. And he asks, is there one piece of music that you think we should all hear? And if so, what is it and why? What a beautiful question. Thank you so much, David. Oh, my goodness. Um, I, you know, it's, it's like favorite foods. It changes for me. Whatever I'm eating at that moment is my favorite food. Whatever I'm listening to at that moment is my favorite. Um, I think there's so many incredibly inspiring. Um, and again, to Monica's, to Monica's point about prescription arts, I think there are different prescribed applications of certain musical pieces. So for me, um, I can say that you know, for this moment, I will speak to my reality this morning in New York City, um, there are pieces. And in fact, I love one of the very smart young students. I'll, I'll have to look back in my email chain, but I know that you had already sent over some answers um, and questions earlier today. And someone had mentioned the Freedom Singers. Now, I would really love for everyone after this call or during it to Google Freedom Singers. Um, the Freedom Singers were part of the civil rights movement here in the United States and they drove forward the goals of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and all of the great civil rights workers through music that had been based oftentimes in gospel tradition, um, We Shall Overcome, uh, Lift Every Voice and Sing, profound spiritual pieces that spoke to the historical moment and they gave people energy for the social justice fight. So I know right now I am listening to a lot of, of spiritual music um, as we think about Black Lives Matter here in the United States and all over the world. And so, I don't know, I think um, as far as pieces that, that we should all be listening to, I would say personally, a lot of that uh, wonderful freedom singing um, from the civil rights movement, I think is something that everybody should be listening to today. And David, I love your question also because it makes me think of a communal musical moment. And maybe this is a fun challenge for you students to be thinking about, how do you get us all listening to something at the same time? Can you imagine that? Um, I think something very powerful can happen when we have in real time, some sort of shared musical moment. So um, thank you for that question. I, I, I love that. Wonderful, thank you. And I love the idea of sending it back to our students and what can they do It's such a, an easy concept and so powerful. Um, we're going to move to a question from our Q&A. This is a question from Sachi. Uh, it sounds like you're pretty busy already, but are you working on anything else except Sing for Hope? <laughs> That's a great question. You know, thank you for that question. So Sachi, um, Camille and I have been active performers this entire time while simultaneously building Sing for Hope. I think that, again, we're very lucky that we were graduates of Juilliard and, and um, were able to forge ahead in our performance careers. And many times those intertwine and sometimes they don't. Um, I know pre-COVID I was singing in, in New Mexico um, on an incredible opera called Alibaba, which had not been dug up for you know 200 years. No one had seen the score and an, an intrepid conductor found the score and uh, and mounted a production of this wonderful opera called Alibaba. Um, Camille also continues to perform. So we do both. We do both as best as we can. And we are also moms of 
wonderful boys. I have a five-year-old son and Camille has a 15-year-old son. And so um, we keep very busy, but, but to, to a great question, we keep those artistic habits of mind absolutely in, intact. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Um, so I think you've been so inspirational for us that we'd like um, our students now to think about how they can start their own um, outreach programs in the future. So many of our students have asked if you could give tips on how they could start their own community outreach programs. And especially in this time, you've spoken a lot about how you changed um, Thing for Hope during COVID-19. Could you maybe give some advice about how our students could do that too? Thank you. Absolutely. It's a wonderfully big question. Um, you know, I think the first thing I would say, honestly, is just start. Do not wait for the perfect moment. Do not wait to have the problems already pre-solved in your head. Um, you know, I, th I think, again, hearkening back to, I guess, what is sort of our theme here today, artistic habits of mind. One of the great things about the artistic process is it is a given that you do not emerge fully formed on stage. It is an iterative process. You rehearse, you fall flat, your notes crack, you slip and, you know, halfway fall off the stage, you know, you, you make a canvas that doesn't look at all like what you'd wanted. But through the iterative process, that's a fun word, by the way, iteration, meaning changing and evolving every time you do it. Through that process, that rehearsal process, eventually you arrive at what you feel to be your masterpiece. So that same, same process goes through organizational movements, I would, I would say. Um, if you have an idea of something you want to do, just start. See what happens. Um, we had a wonderful, by the way, a fun note, mentors. Find people that you admire, that are wise, and don't be afraid to ask them questions. Monica and I have always done that very well, and one of our early wise mentors gave us a really great little rallying cry, which is fail quickly. Meaning, don't, don't try not to fail, don't try to be perfect, and don't try not to mistake, make mistakes, because that's going to happen. But fail quickly, go for it, make the mistake, pick yourself up and move on. That is the key to success, I really do think. And you know, so to, to creating your own community outreach programs, start by asking yourself the question, what change do you wanna see in the world? And then just begin, you can you know, brainstorm ideas and share them and turn to mentors, turn to wise people, ask them what they think, and then just get started. That's lovely. Such a great advice for everything as well. You know, just keep going, keep powering on and you'll find something that you love. Um, I've got a question on the Q&A, which I'm very curious about. I hadn't thought of it, but it's an interesting question. Aditi says, if 9-11 hadn't occurred, do you think you would have created Sing for Hope? That's a great question. Mm -hmm. um, I think eventually something, we would have started something. I think that's just the personalities of Camille, myself and um, maybe we would have learned something quicker, faster, you know, hindsight is always twenty twenty, And I think both Camille and I are always looking back and thinking, well, if we had done this sooner, maybe we would have learned that, that lesson that we needed to learn sooner so that we could have been further ahead or whatever. But I think that had 9-11 not happened, um, I think we would have found our way somehow to bringing the arts to, um, to as wide a community as possible. As, as we started this conversation, you know, Camille has, um, her parents were in the Peace Corps. My father, of course, is Mohammed Yunus, the Nobel Peace Prize laureate for, um, for microcredit for the founding of Grameen Bank in Bangladesh. And I think that as much as I, we both love um, being on stage and being part of opera performances or recitals, or I think that we've always wanted to bring the arts to as big an audience as possible. And I think that, um, you know, sort of hooking arms with other artists and giving them this opportunity to share and to create in, in um, maybe unusual spaces like hospital rooms, like Zoom rooms. <laughs> I think that eventually we would have found our way to, um, to something, to something that would have led us directly to what we're doing right now. I, I feel pretty strongly about that. I don't know about you, Camille, but that's, that's, my, that's my view. I do, and I, lo I love that answer, Monica. And I, I think, um, yeah, you know, I think we both, 
it's funny, you know, it's not that we don't believe in opera companies and symphonies and, and concert halls. It's that we believe in them so much that we feel that they need to be broadly accessed. And the reality, in particular, when we were coming out of Juilliard 2003, 2004, the reality is that there, um, I think some of that hadn't been explored. No, let me, let me rephrase that. It's not that I think some of it hadn't been explored. It flat out hadn't. <laughs> there hadn't been enough, um, I think there really hadn't been enough um, sort of built in mechanisms for artists to go directly into communities. And I think that has, that has evolved. I think that it is in the ether. All arts organizations that I know of are super, super eager to find these nimble ways to put the art in the stream of life. Yo-Yo Ma, another wonderful Google name. Yo-Yo Ma, wonderful cellist. If you don't know him already, please do Google him. His music making is so inspiring, but also his thinking about the role of the arts is so inspiring. And he is the one who always uses this phrase that I love so much, which is art in the stream of life. You know, just, yes, we love it in the concert hall and that is awesome, but it's so good that like, let's also put it in the middle of the street. And that's the philosophy behind the synchro pianos. Let's take a, a hot pink piano, put a bow on it, put it in the middle of the Bronx Grand Concourse and say to the community, this is yours. And let's, let's, let's go meet, meet our, our audiences, quote unquote, on new turf and on new terms and, and with that openness of heart and that, that sense of mutual welcome. I think that is a, a really exciting thing to us. And so, um, so yeah, you know, I think we were, we were on this path and it's a path that feels more relevant now than ever. Um, and I think, you know, the, we're lucky, all of us, again, I, I include all of us on this, this call as being creatives and as being artists and as having this very joyful way to engage with social justice. It's, it's a very, we often say, you know, it's a, it's a profoundly joyful and whimsical way of dealing with very serious and very painful issues. Camille, you're just a little muted. Oh, excuse me. Sorry. I need to speak up. I need to use my singer voice. I'm just saying that I think, you know, again, we, we have the opportunity through the creative arts to address these searingly painful issues of the day, and they are painful. Um, difficult social injustices and pandemics of loneliness and COVID. We can do it through something that is fundamentally joyful and filled with hope. And that is the gift of the creative arts. And I think that's what powers all of us who are on this, this call today. Hey, thank you very much. Um, another practical question a little bit. So you mentioned training the Broadway artists yourselves um, to go into the hospitals and to, um, to do this thing for Hopograms. But I wondered if you could let us know a little bit about what you tell them. So what's the way you can create the perfect thing for Hopogram? Sure. Oh, I love that question. Um, I was going to say, you know, you, you can do a sing for Hopogram for your mom or dad or, or anyone you like. You know, if you wanted to start that, you can absolutely do that. You just pick up your phone, you call a friend, you call a loved one, maybe it's a, a grandparent, and you just say, hi, I'm, I'm a, a sing for Hope artist and I'd love to sing you a song. Do you have a few moments? Do you have a time, a little bit of time for a musical gift? And then you just start singing. A lot of the Sing for Hope artists that we have do have many years of Broadway or singing around the world and on apparatic stages. And um, even, even for them, it's a little bit of a change to deliver a performance like this. And so I think that, um, you know, some of the things that we talk to them about is how to look directly into the camera so you feel like you're being spoken to, like I'm doing right now. <laughs> um, it's um, acknowledging that maybe this is not the exact moment for them to, maybe you caught them right as they were washing dishes or something like that, you know, so you want to give them an opportunity to get comfortable. And if they have any other family members that want to experience this music with them, you know, you give them an opportunity um, by saying, you know, is there anyone that you're with that you'd like you'd like for them to hear it. Maybe you want to put this on speaker um, or maybe gather around the, the computer screen. And then you just say, you know, I'm, I'm delivering this musical gift to you courtesy of your sister or whomever, or I just wanted to give you this musical gift. And you just sing a song. But we give our Sing for Hope artists a, a few pointers to make sure that people don't feel like they're getting a call out of the blue. 
um, you know, it's, it's a, it's, it might be a phone number they don't recognize. So if, if they don't pick up the phone, what should they do? Um, these sort of logistical um, little pointers that we take them through in the training um, for that specific program. And in general, as I mentioned before, we do have Sing for Hope artist orientations. And again, in that sphere, we give the artist partners who are wanting to volunteer um, the sort of scope of what they would see if they went into a school or if they went into a hospital setting or if they were working, you know, we have a facility that deals with um, children who've had traumatic brain injuries. So what does that look like and how comfortable is it for them to go into a space like that? You know, they, they might have to deal with their own emotions. Maybe seeing that will make them sad. So how do they come in with the sense of, of hope and uplift while simultaneously dealing with, um, with what might feel to them as a sad or uncomfortable moment. Um, it's important to note that Sing for Hope artists are not music therapists. There is a specific training, a four-year program that music therapists go through. Our artists do not go through that program and they do not have that certification. So what we try to do is give them the scope of, of, of um, of reference for each facility. We work with those facilities to ensure that our um, Sing for Hope artists have all of the tools and the understanding of each one of those facilities uh, guiding principles. So that's just a little bit of, um, of overview of how we, how we orient people in the different programs. Exactly, and we are very fortunate. We have a terrific team of 16 full-time team members, including a licensed clinical social worker who helps essentially, um, as Monica said, orient the artist whose background really is for something a bit different. I mean, we're trained to be on stage. And so this has many of those same, same learnings, but uh, there are different layers. And so we, we do drill down on those in our trainings. And I think, you know, in the same way that the art of a traditional vocal technique when you're singing an opera in an opera house it contains certain truths um, that we deliver we also sort of maintain kind of an art of community engagement through the arts and that's what we train our artists through the orientation to do now in the virtual space thank you that's that's really really interesting very helpful um and our time is flying because we're nearly at 10 o'clock but there's one kind of themed question that keeps popping up on our q a so i'm kind of merging a few questions students into one and it's uh, you mentioned Yo-Yo Ma but um, students are quite keen to know who are some of your inspirations who are people that inspire you that's a great question gosh I have so many sort of categories of different kind of people I have an artistic category I have sort of a social justice category I have sort of a career aspirational category so I think oh, that's a, t that's a hard question. Um, I think I'm super lucky because I have uh, a Nobel Peace Prize laureate for a dad. So that's pretty, he inspires me. Um, I'm constantly inspired by how he continues to work. He's about to turn 80 years old on June 28th and he's still working harder than anyone I know. And that's post uh, Nobel laureate status. So he's somebody that inspires me in his stick to itness and for building something that goes, you know, beyond just a village in Bangladesh to, a, you know, to something that's affected so many global communities. That said, I will also say I've had a number of people come and say to me, you know, well, your dad won a Nobel Peace Prize. What do you do? So <laughs> there's that too. <laughs> but in all honesty, I'm, I'm very lucky because I have somebody that I just look to or I can ask a question of and, and that's, that's pretty special and, and very, very rare. Um, and then artistically, um, I have loved this particular singer since I was a child and I just love the, the, the soprano Marilla Franey. She's just someone who, no matter what she sings, it just sounds like an angelic voice to me. And so I've always looked up to her, her artistry and her, um, and her gorgeous singing, one of many. Um, yeah, I have to think more on that, but those are the two that immediately come to my mind. I, I love it. I could keep you for many, many more hours here and I'll, I'll be disciplined and not do that. But um, two people that just pop into my mind. Um, my, so much of my music making comes from my sweet 
father, who's now my guardian angel. Um, he passed a couple of years ago, but he sort of brought music into my life. He was a guitarist um, by vocation. He was a teacher by trade. And he, his family, he's Hispanic, and he grew up singing Spanish songs to me. And so I really gravitate to that music. And one of my favorite singers is a amazing singer called Mercedes Sosa. S-O-S-A, give her a Google. She has a piece called Gracias a la Vida que me ha, da, me ha dado tanto. Thanks to life that has given me so much. And she also, you know, she has done great social justice work in her life, but she's done it through incredibly beautiful music making. Um, and then one other singer I'll mention is Nina Simone, another great singer you should Google, who just with such joy and rigor and just beautiful musicianship drove incredible social justice goals in her life. And uh, definitely just a great person to listen to, Nina Simone. Thank you so much. I know that's probably one of the hardest questions, isn't it, in reflection? <laughs> How many hours do you have? I know, <laughs> it's really hard. Um, Monica and Camille, I can't thank you enough for your time today. I think your passion, your inspiration, and your work is going to leave um, a real indentation in everybody who has watched this webinar. And I sincerely hope that our students are going to think about your contribution to communities and really act upon that. Um, so on behalf of our students, our teaching community, um, we're just really grateful to have you involved with us and thank you so much for your time today. Thank, thank you, you all. Much. It's just been such a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for having really us. Has. Thank you for having us.